Welcome to the Korean Art Podcast. I'm your host, Jed Lee Henry, and on today's show, we have Vladimir Tikhonov. Vladimir is a professor of Korean studies at the University of Oslo and a historian of the thorny issue of Korean nationalism, which we're going to be speaking about today, specifically the rise and the concept of the Minjok, or ethno nationalism. For this, we're going to dig into some deep history, go back to ancient Chosun, the Three Kingdoms period, Goryeo, and the Chosun dynasty. And look at where this concept of the ethno nation state built up. How important the idea of Koreanness as a single bloodline was before the period of Japanese colonization. But it is in this period of Japanese colonization where this idea of a unique Koreanness really explodes. And it comes quite paradoxically. It comes from a realization that Koreans were being both discriminated against and victimized. And so it was from that collective discrimination. That Koreans began to see themselves as a distinct people, a distinct race of people. They always saw themselves as distinct from the Japanese, of course, but this was a moment when the nation itself was forming, when clan hierarchies were breaking down, when the Yangbang or official scholars became less and less important, and when geographical differences were wiped away by colonization. This two step legal system that distinguished what Koreanness was often became the driving force for protest movements. Such as the March 1st independence movement in 1919. Sure, the idea of Wilsonian self independence was in their mind, but what justified this for many people was the fact that they were of one race, of one people. But of course, this is a period in time when Marxism becomes the dominant narrative for liberation and independence. Around the world, every time a movement is looking to shake off the shackles of imperialism or colonization, or simply break down the class structures, Marxism tends to fill the void at this time. And there is an immediate clash here, at least in ideology. The nationalist side are claiming that Koreans are unique because of their bloodline. And Marxism, of course, claims on the other side that all people around the world, regardless who they are, are equal and the same. And so the debates and the battles between these two movements grow. And countless scholars across the years try to bridge these two groups together, try to justify both halves at the same time. And it isn't really until the Great Depression hits that this begins to permanently splinter and the two groups become, in many ways, irreconcilable. But this is a game that Korean Marxists had tried before. They had also attempted to incorporate Koreans' Confucian heritage into their own worldview. And of course, why this all matters so much today is the simple fact that the Minjok still survives. The concept is still there on the ground. And in Vladimir's own words, still serves as the main instrument of strengthening socio cultural cohesion. As well as the ideological ground for South Korea's claim to eventual unification with North Korea. And with this in mind, we're going to step forward into the present moment and look at how all this has changed or how it has stayed the same across the years. And interestingly, and in part, we're going to do this through a look at the rise and the fall of the new right movement inside South Korea in the 2000s. This was an attempt by right wing factions inside South Korean politics to change the idea of how they view history. Instead of looking back with a notion of Minjok, of Korean race in their mind, and therefore being heavily critical of the Japanese colonial period, based of course on their subjugation of the Korean people, instead this movement hoped that we would look back with an economic eye on things, and an idea of a growing civilization, that the Japanese colonial period in fact helped Korea grow, helped Korea develop, helped Korea become what they are today. And so all those Korean collaborators who've been vilified for so many years should suddenly be rehabilitated as well. They didn't stand against the Korean race, as has so often been the narrative, but for its long term development and success. And of course, we're going to speak about why this movement, ending with the downfall of Park Geun-hye, failed to achieve this, and in what way it still survives inside South Korea today. Underneath this podcast, I'm going to link Vladimir's research and all the articles that I used in preparation for this podcast. I encourage listeners to go and read them for themselves. There is a lot more fundamental detail there that we didn't get a touch on throughout the podcast. As always, this podcast is entirely funded by you, the listener. And if you do want it to continue, please consider supporting the podcast directly at the Patreon account or the PayPal link attached below. Failing that, you can always share, like, or comment on the podcast across social media. And feel free to reach out with suggestions for future guests. On that, and to talk us through Korean nationalism and the question of the ethno nation state, this is Vladimir Tikhonov.
Vladimir Tikhanov, thanks for coming on the Korean Hour podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me. So today we're going to be talking about something really quite fascinating and quite timely as it always is, which is Korean nationalism and the idea of the Minjok or this uh, race-based nationalism. So before we get into the history and then build it up, I might get you to give us a very brief overview of what we're talking about. Just so when people get into this, they have a, uh, a flag where they can plant and they'll know where we're heading. Well, we are going to talk now about the Korean concept of Minjok, as a nation. The concept is historically quite new. The word first emerged in Korean language publications only in the end of the last decade of 19th century. So it is historically new, but it's enormously influential both in South and North Korea and among Korean diaspora. It's perhaps among the, say, 10 most important keywords which one has to understand in order to understand the concept of Koreanness, so to say. And it is also controversial recently, since especially South Korea is no longer populated exclusively by ethnic Koreans. So for now in South Korea, the sphere of its use is getting narrower. It's much less used than before, although it's still used in the context, for example, of discussions related to Korean unification, since it is the ideological basis of any unification to come. Well, then, if you allow me, should I begin my talk with the very concept of ethno-nation globally? That's yeah, what German yeah. people call das Volk. Because yes, jump, jump into that and then we can build the history up from there. Yeah, yeah, begin right exactly. there, absolutely. Because Koreans didn't invent ethno-nationalism. <laughs> it was invented <laughs> before that. <laughs> well, in 50s and 60s, when the study of nationalism took off in Western Europe and Northern America, there was a sort of rough division into civic nationalism a la France and United States and ethnic nationalism of German and Central European kind. There were theoreticians of nationalism who thought that very roughly 19th century classical nationalism should be divided into more civic varieties in the countries which underwent classical bourgeois democratic revolutions and more ethnic varieties in the countries where instead of democratic revolution you had national unification war, like in Germany, or national, well, nation-building struggles, like in the countries which emerged after the collapse of Habsburg Empire. So the idea was that American or French nationalisms tend to be civic-based and more or less ethnically blind, uh, 19th century, I mean, while in, say, German case, or in case of other Eastern or Northern European nations, it wasn't necessarily so. Most Central and Northern European nations indeed follow their uh, use sanguinis. It, it's still so, actually. You see, I'm not a Norwegian. I'm living in Norway, so I have another citizenship. So my children, although they are born in Norway, are not going to get Norwegian citizenship automatically. They have to apply for it when they become more or less grown up. In a way, it's what is called youth sanguinis. It still is applicable in many Central and Northern European nations. Differs a lot from American practices, actually. So that was the original division into civic and ethnic nationalism. As we understand now, it's too schematic. Most nationalisms are combination of both. In America, of course, well, theoretically, everybody born in the United States was American by birth. But until the 1960s, if you were born black, you were not exactly the same American, <laughs> to, uh, to put it this way, uh, mildly. And then there were strong elements of civic nationalism in many Central and Northern European nations as well. So usually it's all mixed up. But in Korean case, Korean nationalism is a very interesting combination of both civic and ethnic varieties. Today's Korean nationalism has to be also based on political belonging, 
since there are two Koreas. <laughs> you cannot <laughs> simply, <laughs> in a way, promote ethnic nationalism in the view of the fact that there are two Korean nation, uh, two, two Korean states which claim their nationalistic, in a way, nationalistic uh, credentials. So to say, you cannot simply promote Minjok only. You also need a strong political component. At the same time, since both Korean states are fighting for the right to represent Korea and Koreanness, they also have to be ethno-nationalist to a certain degree. <laughs> so mm. it makes ethno-nationalism pretty prominent in both Koreas, and it was even more prominent during the colonial age for the simple fact Koreans were ethnically discriminated. <laughs> if you happen to be a Japanese empire citizen of Korean mm. descent, you had it on your household registration, and your rights were curtailed. It, it was simply colonial ethnic discrimination. And in a sort of inter interesting enough, it was actually ethnic discrimination that made ethnic nationalism of Koreans much stronger, <laughs> since it was the nationalism of the people who were, well, discontent about the discrimination, and many of them were trying to fight it. So to say. So in Korean case, ethno-nationalism stands pretty strong due to those historical circumstances. But if you allow me, I will begin the story from the very beginning. Yes, yes, please do that. So head, head back a little bit and touch on the pre-colonial era and then break yes. us into the the colonial era, the Japanese period that you mentioned there and how this all builds up. So yes. I'll leave you the floor here, absolutely. Yes. So, well, the idea that all Koreas compose an ethno-nation, the very idea of Das Volk, ethno-nation, came to Korea via Japan in the end of the last decade of 19th century. A number of Koreans started to go to study to Japan, and they found out that the newly coined Meiji Japanese identity is both political and ethno-national. So the word for ethno-nation, Japanese coined while translating folk, Minzoku, was quickly appropriated by Koreans. It's pronounced Minjok. It first appears in Korean sources around 1898. But then it started to appear in much, much larger numbers, in much, much sort of stronger degree after the year 1905. And the reason is very simple. Year 1905, Russia was humiliated and defeated by Japan, and Korea became the sole preserve of the Japanese imperialism, which forced a protectorate treaty onto the incapable Korean state. Korea became protectorate of Japan. So Korean statehood was obviously threatened by colonization. So Korean intellectuals felt it very acutely, and they started to think, okay, we are going to be colonized. So in case our state disappears, which was now a very tangible possibility, what is going to remain? And what was going to remain was ethno-nation. So if you calculate the frequency of the use of Min Jok in major Korean newspapers, the peak was 1907. <laughs> <laughs> exactly the year when Japanese disbanded the old Korean army. <laughs> so to say, so you have no army, you are no longer a state, but you are still a Minjok. That so, just, so just to clarify there, the, the idea of the Minjok, which would still exist today, it, it, it really wasn't mentioned in any huge detail or it wasn't fundamental to Koreans' life. So this idea of a nation state, that they are a uniquely pure-blooded race, this didn't really exist before this period. No. Uh, the dynastic state was not based on ethnic nationalism. It was based on the heavenly mandate of Choson dynasty. Uh. Choson dynasty maintained that it had mandate to rule Korea because of, well, exemplary moral behavior of its royals and because of the exemplary Confucian statecraft it has been demonstrating. 
Ethnic belonging of the people ruled by the dynasty was very secondary issue. There were, say, some Georgian people mixing together with Koreans in the northern part of Korea. There were Chinese mean royalists who came to Korea to live. There were former Japanese, uh, well, you, you can call them citizen subjects, who sometimes were coming to Korea and obtaining the right to live, obtaining the status of Korean subjects. It was all okay. Nobody, basically, it was not that important. The language of the ruling elite was classical Chinese. Written language of the ruling elite was classical Chinese. So, so to say, it wasn't an ethno-national language. And when it comes to the people below the dynastic state, the main unit of identity was, after all, a village or family. If you belonged to Yanban, the gentry stratum, the main unit of identity was extended clan, Munjun, so, so to say. So you were supposed to be filial to your parents, you were loyal to your clan, and you were loyal to the dynasty. That's how identity construction was being built. Ethno nation didn't have to belong there <laughs> in a way. Mm. Although I have to add that in some way, Korea had a sort of proto-nationalism already in early modern time. There was very clear consciousness of being, I mean, of belonging to a succession of dynasties which ruled this particular place. And there was lots of, for example, well, a sort of enmity vis-a-vis all possible neighbors. There were not that many neighbors, actually. <laughs> so Japanese were viewed with suspicion after Hideyoshi invasion of the 1590-1598, understandably. And then Japanese were always suspect because they were not actually fully Confucianized. Or at least that's what Koreans thought. Mm. <laughs> Koreans thought that they were much more thoroughly Confucian than Japanese. <laughs> so with Chinese, Qin Dynasty was viewed with some disrespect because it was not properly, authentically Chinese. So Koreans always believed that they were more authentic heirs to the glory of mean dynasty statehood than those thin Manjurian barbarians. So I'm so, just going to cut in for a second there because this is this, this proto Koreanness that you mentioned. This is fascinating yeah. because we're going to get to it in a second, of course. But uh, Koreans, when they talk about the Minjok, the pure race, they talk about uh, the divine progenitor Tangun, the first Korean. So was there any idea back in this period, this proto Korean period, that Korean history was that deep, or did this end a lot before that? This uh, Tangun, I believe, is uh, oh, 3000 or 2300 BC. You see, it's an interesting point, actually. First mention of Tangun comes in late 13th century. So it is claimed that he was the founder of the ancient Choson state. But you have no mentions of Tangun in antiquity and no mentions of Tangun in early Korea dynasty, epigraphical monuments, for example, which is actually suspicious. <laughs> if there yes. was a myth of Tangun which had been conveyed throughout the centuries, why it didn't show itself in any epigraphic monument of Silla, for example? But anyway, mm. so to say, we don't have it. It just comes up in late Koryo. But then what is interesting is that if you look at the usages of Tangun throughout the Choson dynasty documents, Tangun is mentioned sometimes, but very unfrequently. There were some Tangun-related memorial places. So on the Korean memory scape, memotic scape, uh, memotic landscape, Tangun did exist. But it was very much dwarfed by much more important figure of ancestor, and that was Kija. Kija is a Korean pronunciation of Jizu, Viscount of Tsi. And in Korean and Chinese myth history, it was a figure, I mean, it was a virtuous man of late uh, Yin dynasty who moved to 
what became Korea afterwards and civilized Koreans. There are mentions of Jizi, Y count, we count, Y count of Tzi in Chinese dynastic sources, and he was extensively mentioned in Chosen dynasty sources as a civilizing hero. So, for Korea, what was more important for Chosun Dynasty Koreans was not Korea's own civilization or genealogy, but the connection between Shan In Dynasty's greatness and ancient Korea, <laughs> in a way. Mm. Zi Zi Kija was mentioned much, much more frequently than Tangun in Chosun Dynasty. <laughs> so, so to say, so there was certainly some sort of proto-nationalism, but it was much more civilizational than ethno-national. Well, it was much more important that Korea was early civilized, supposedly by people from Shan Ying, the most ancient dynasty of China after Xia. That was very much stressed. But Tangun Tangun part wasn't that much emphasized, you know. <laughs> mm. It became, well, it started to be emphasized in last pre-colonial decade, in fact. Well, let's that's, that's, that's step us forward then to the development of uh, the Minjok, or at least this idea of Koreanness. And I suppose, as you mentioned there, it, it comes about through this fascinating idea in people's minds that they are suddenly discriminated against. And if we discriminate against as a whole people, then we must be a distinctive people. So I'm wondering, in a sense, uh, who was part of this? Because I have to assume, in at least in some small part, that the idea of the Minjok in people's minds may not have properly included um, women, for example, or how strong it was the caste system still here, or did the Minjok wipe away a lot of the pre that pre-colonial uh, classism inside society? Oh, well, it's a very interesting part, actually. What happened is that in the last pre-colonial decade, Minjok was very emphasized by the intellectuals, and Tangun started to be emphasized as well. Many intellectuals were still people born in Confucian lineage villages, so they imagined Minjok as a large extended Munjun, as a large extended clan, and then Tangun was given the place of the clan ancestor. All Korean clans have honored ancestors. <laughs> so to say, so if our ethno nation is a one super clan, giga clan, then it's important who is our ancestor, who our ancestor is. So Tangun was given this place. But it was a construction very much imposed from above. That is by the circle of intellectuals who were busy establishing the new Korean identity. Below, life very much continued as it used to. You should understand that by the year 1919, when a huge pro-independence demonstration started in colonized Korea, only around 3% of Korean girls went to the school. So in reality, <laughs> absolute mm. majority of Korean women were illiterate. And the degree of their consciousness outside of their village and family had to be pretty much restricted. But it's important, the very important part here is the 1919, the much first independence movement. Those demonstrations included lots of women. By the way, interestingly, Kisen were prominent, the female entertainers. Some of them lately beca became socialists, actually. <laughs> Those Kisen who demonstrated during the 1919 much first de pro independence demonstrations, there were former slaves there were the butcher spectrum. There were all sort of base low people who joined up. And that was the, and then it was pan-regional. Traditional Choson society was an aristocratic monarchical polity with a very complicated hierarchy of status groups. Of course, women were largely excluded from the body politic, but the same goes for base people, Chonmin including, for example, monks and butchers. And then there were lots of slaves. Well, lots of, around 9% of population were slaves by the point the slavery was officially abolished in 1894. So to say, but in many villages, former slaves still were very much despised and relegated to lower tasks. So it was a very complicated hierarchy of status groups. But it changed with the colonization because former gentry young men, former slaves, butchers, women, 
all of them got the marking Handojin, the peninsula people on their household registration. All were marked with being Korean. And then they started feeling themselves so Korean, actually. Mm -hmm. And in the 1990s, they all together came to demonstrate against this discrimination for being a nation of undiscriminated free people again. 1919, exactly 100 years ago, was very much the starting point of many things in modern Korea, including pro-democracy movement, because that was the first time democratic republic became the primary model of a modern statehood. Before that, pro-independence fighters wanted to restore monarchy. Okay, so that, that's a fascinating point. Let's stop there and dig in because 1919 yeah. and this March 1st uh, uh, movement that people have in their minds, as you said there, it's this pro-democratic movement. But are you also saying that um, as much as it was for freedom and uh, liberation, it was also for the race itself as a people? So it's not just a idea of uh, democratization. It's more a, a, a march for uh restoring independence to the race it it is always like this in korean history that some sort of nationalism and some sort of pro-democracy movement get just blended blended mixed up you had it in 1987 for example 1987 millions of koreans demonstrated against corrupt anti-democratic dictatorship of chon duk Ban. But one important scene of Chon Duh Wan, beyond being corrupt, bloody dictator, was that he was an American puppet. So the people were demonstrating also against being ruled by a foreign puppet. That was important part. And you always had this Minjok, Minju, Minjun triad. A nation, democracy, and the people. <laughs> uh, so to say, 1919, it was very much the same. There was an understanding that in order to get their human rights back, not to be discriminated, Koreans need independent Korean state. At the same time, it's important to remember that this movement, both national and democratic, now included also formally discriminated categories of population. Chosun society was no egalitarian paradise. It was a rigid hierarchy of status groups. Colonialism undermined it. And now, with anti-colonial movement, lots of formerly discriminated people came up. And that was a very important point, actually. So that's, uh, there's a question that must be nagging in people's minds as, as they listen to this. If anyone makes the, uh, the claim that they are a unique race of people and we should have ethno-nationalism, there has to be certain values and principles or special features that come along with this. So how do Koreans see themselves through this ethno-nationalism? Well, you see, in 1920s was a golden age of modern Korean culture after the great 1919 much lost movement. Nationalists of Korea were coming up with all those series of Korean national character. Uh, we should remember one thing. National character is not what you use in the academic discourse today. <laughs> if I will be talking about, say, American national character, people will make a laughing stock out of me. <laughs> we know that, well, nations are too complicated and too many. <laughs> they, uh, they consist of too many different people, classes, groups, and so on to talk about their characters. In the uh, 1920s, the world was very different. You still had pretty serious academics studying national character, so national psychology. One of the last such studies, by the way, was the famous book by Ruth Benedict, The Chrysanthemum and Sword, which now is considered a classic of anthropology. But of course, it's a much flawed classic because it assumes that all Japanese somehow share the same national psyche. We don't think so any longer. But it was pretty normal in American academia in 1930s and 1940s to think so. Anyway, so in 1920s, it was pretty normal on global level to talk about national character. And lots of Koreans were coming up with their theories of national character. There were basically two streams here. 
there were more critical people like Li Guang Su, a famous Korean prose writer, who thought that basic Korean national character is virtuous, good, and extremely life, uh, life-loving, uh, optimistic, so, so to say, model. However, Koreans were subjected to signification for a very long time, and then their character got twisted up. Koreans became disorganized, egoistic, lazy, and so on and so on. So what Igwan Su suggested that Koreans needed Minjok Kejo, national reconstruction. They had to discipline themselves. They had to become sportive, responsible, altruistic, collectivistic, and organized. Just like, say, American middle class. <laughs> in a way, <laughs> much of it was about modeling Koreans on supposedly more successful nations. But this theory was criticized even among the nationalists, not to speak about Marxists, who were just completely aghast in such an unscientific theory. From the viewpoint of Marxists, even at that point, uh, the talks about Korean national character correction <laughs> were sounding too unscientifically. And then there were other nationalist theoreticians like famous Chasan Anhwak, a very interesting popular, well, even called popularizer of national, of national studies probably today, who suggested that Koreans were just positive, that they were kind, warm-hearted, optimistic, and generally had a very positive national character. It was an attempt to counter the Japanese Orientalist misrepresentations of Koreaness, of course, because the Japanese colonialists were often suggesting that Korean national character is deeply flawed. Of course, Korean nationalists were supposed to say that it wasn't the case. Uh, so, so to say, so there were lots of discussions of national character between the nationalists, but then there were also socialists and Marxists who wanted to put the discussion on a completely diff- different level, who actually thought that there exists no national character and that ethno nation is just a product of history. They were scientific. But it was a different stream in the discussion. So before we jump into the Marxism, and there's going to be a huge part of this discussion, mm-hmm. of course, there is something that uh, that that I, I suppose clangs my ear and needs, I suppose, some clarification here. This mm-hmm. is the the idea in many people's minds there is that uh, Korea have a Koreans have a unique set of attributes or characteristics about themselves, which and this has to be rediscovered. And that sounds like something that is solid and given and unchanging. And yet there's also this idea at the same time that uh, from this ethno nationalism, a political nationalism can also build up and then Korea can develop. And that implies in some sense a variable character. So how did how does this come across through the literature here? Did Koreans tend, tend, to, tend to see their nature as something that was forever how it was going to be? Or was there something variable and changeable over time? Oh, well, there was a very strong idea, for example, with people like Li Guang Su, moderate cultural nationalist. Well, by the end of the 1970s, Li Guang Su became more or less a collaborator with the Japanese imperial war machine. But in the 1920s, he still was counted as cultural nationalist. So the idea was that character correction is something like a process of recovery from a disease. Koreans were initially very good people, nice, kind-hearted, kind-hearted, uh, life-loving, and so on and so on. But then they were signified and they were corrupted by uh, feudal dynasties. They ended up being disorganized, extremely clannish, egoistic, groupistic, and so on. But then, once we cleanse and correct their national character, we prepare the ground for eventual independence. And as soon as our national character becomes more, less corrupt, in a way, more in line with the world developments, 
the ground for independence will be prepared, and at the opportune moment it would be possible to demand independence. That was this sort of idea. In Korean language, it's called Tongnip Chun Biron, the idea of preparing for eventual independence by a sort of moral recalibration of the nation. Marxists, of course, were criticizing all this stuff, suggesting, not without good grounds, that it was very much based on the self-interests of Korea's Naskin bourgeoisie, which wanted to use this movement to gain hegemony over the national consciousness, over the national movement. Marxists probably had, were right to some degree in that. Anyway, but we should remember, as we are talking about 20s and 30s, Koreans were not alone in those longish discussions about national character. In Japan, it was a wow. So in Japan, it was extremely fashionable to discuss Japanese national character. And uh, you remember the nice, well, nice, <laughs> interesting book by Watsuji Tetsuro, <coughs> Kyoto University professor. Uh, Japanese title is Fudo. And English translation, it was the climate and history, something like this. Uh, Watsuji Tetsuro supposed the Japanese had unique national character, which was based on the unique climate and geography of Japanese islands. Japan was one harmonious family from the very beginning. Japanese imperial system didn't necessitate the use of violence. And thus, Japanese are different from both European societies based on interest, but not familial ties, and from China, where society is just a conglomeration of egoistic individuals. So was there any cross-learning here? Did Koreans uh, learn, uh, at least in some, at least the idea that there could be a unique race of people in some ways from seeing that Japan were calling themselves a unique race of people? Yes, I would suggest so definitely in the 1930s, there was a very strong influence of Kyoto school to which Watsuji Tetsuro belonged mm. upon Korea's increasingly conservative and increasingly pro-Japanese cultural nationalism. 1930s, definitely. 1920s, it's an interesting point. Yes, there was a cross-learning from Japan, but when Lee Gwang Su wrote his seminal Minjok Ke Joron, the treatise on reconstruction of Korean ethno-nation, his main source, albeit in Japanese translation, was Gustave Le Bon. Gustave Le Bon and Le Bon's writings on mass psychology and ethno national psychology. <laughs> so to say, so cross-learning was not uh, in a way limited to East Asian region, it was much broader. More, many of those theories were international Inter well, international cultural commodities it circulated more or less freely <laughs> at that <laughs> point. And, but of course, much of this stuff was coming in Japanese translations. It's so I'm going to ask you a, a tricky question here, and this comes across through reading some of the parts of this of your work here, and that is uh, how manufactured do you think, or even subconsciously manufactured do you think some of this is to the conditions of uh, colonization and the hopes for resistance? Because I'm reading through some of the unique characteristics here that uh, Koreans see themselves as having. It's things like self-sacrificial spirit, uh, public commitment, cooperative skills, and even a merciful attitude towards compatriots. And you, you write here that this was helpful because it would bring people together and help to galvanize the nation against the colonial enemy. So so do you think that uh, a lot of perhaps uh, some of these virtues came about in opposition or in hope of uh, some sort of resistance movement uh, from Korea? Uh, well, you see, we should be a bit dialectical here. <laughs> People <laughs> in colonies or in any sort of subjugated societies live in what a very good Korean contemporary historian, Jung Hedon, very aptly called the grey zone. Gray zone means that you have both resistance and some degree of cooperation. It's impossible to completely discooperate with a colonizer or with an authoritarian government. You most likely wouldn't be able to achieve any of your life goals if you just completely refuse to cooperate. You wouldn't get, I don't know, your, <laughs> your food carts if it's a rationing system. And there was a rationing system in late colonial Korea and so on. At the same time, 
if you are a colonial uh, subaltern, even if you are privileged, even if you cooperate very intensely with the Japanese, even if you are rich, you still remember just a colonial subaltern. You still remember just a colonized Korean. You cannot erase this mark, uh, Hando Jin, the peninsula person, on your household registration. You can't switch it. You cannot switch to being a part of the colonizer settlers community. So to say, so most social cultural <coughs> movements in a colony or under any authoritarian regime, basically, exist as a combination of some sort of resistance, often passive, and some sort of hybridity, I means the colonized are appropriating what they need from the repertoire, from the ideological arsenal of the colonizers. So what happened with Koreans under the Japanese? When you read about say, self-sacrificial spirit and things like this, we should remember that self-sacrificial spirit was a very important point in Japanese colonial textbooks. The Japanese uh, considered it also a unique Japanese virtue. <laughs> so to say, so <laughs> Koreans were learning it from textbooks in the school in colonial time. And certainly, it was easy to appropriate, <laughs> so, so to say. But at the same time, Japanese were busy orientalizing Koreans. There is a very good book by an uh, excellent historian, Stefan Tanaka, Japan's Orient, about the ways how Japanese appropriated Orientalism from Europe. Korea was Japan's Orient. Koreans were represented by Japanese as lazy, uncooperative, egoistic, very egoistic. And of course, Koreans wanted to say, no, that's exactly the opposite of the truth. <laughs> so to say, and Koreans, of course, wanted to represent themselves not as covertly and uncooperative, but as brave and self-sacrificial. So there are both things here. And we should remember that in colonial time, most of colonized society is a gray zone. So let's jump into that fascinating question of Marxism and how this all ties in here, because at the moment, it seems like these two things wouldn't work. The idea of a unique ethno-nationalism seems to clash explicitly with the idea of Marxism, which is a unified nation of people. So how does this happen? Because a huge, a huge infusion in this pro-nationalist movement in Korea is also a Marxist movement. Of course, this was a time in the world when Marxism was the great liberator, at least in theory, and a lot of nations were picking it up. So um, let's jump into this. How do these two things mesh together or not mesh together in your view? Uh, well, Marxists in Korea in 20s and 30s were mostly former nationalists, <laughs> but they were also in most cases educated people. Many of them were educated abroad in Japan, in Moscow, very rarely in the United States, but sometimes in the Japanese public educational institutions in Korea. So they saw Marxism as the vanguard of modernity, the most quintessentially modern thing which they so far could observe. Marxism was the quintessence of scientificity, being scientific. So Marxist underpinned modernity was supposed to be the best of all modernities. You had technological development, but without all those bad things that you find in any capitalist society, without hierarchies, without exploitation, with equality, alternative modernity, so to say. So from Marxist viewpoint, when Marxists were rival rivalizing, sort of fighting against other ideological currents in 20s, 30s Korea. From Marxist viewpoint, the real problem with nationalists was that they were not enough modern and scientific. Nationalism was discursively primitive from Marxist viewpoint. Marxists were painstakingly explaining, citing Kautsky, uh, citing other European treatises, on nationalism, for example, Otto Bauer's work on nations and nationalism, citing Engels and so on, that nations didn't exist in medieval society, that nations in Europe are product of capitalist market development, you need a market 
you need some sort of consolidation of national market to underpin the growth of national consciousness. Otto Bauer wrote extensively about it, and educated Koreans knew it from Japanese translations, and some of them read it in German, so to say. They were explaining that dynastic states of East Asia didn't have national consciousness in the modern meaning of the term. The loyalty went to the dynasty, to the ruling house, not to abstract nation. Nation is a product of capitalism, but then nations are supposed to be also the part and parcel of capitalist ideology. National unity is being preached because capitalists want also to somehow sideline the class interests of the people whom they economically exploit. They were further suggesting that in case of Korea, much of nationalist social movements, like for example, the movement for encouraging Korea's national production, by Korean, by Korean products. <laughs> they were suggesting mm. that those movements were underpinned by very concrete economical interests of Korean bourgeois, who, however, were immediately calling Japanese police. There were telephones already. As soon as their workers, Korean workers, were striking. So, so they were telephoning Japanese police if their Korean workers were striking, but they also wanted their Korean workers to buy only their pro pro produce it was a contradiction, wasn't it? <laughs> and so, so the Marxists were analytical and scientific in their approach to nationalism, but at the same time, they were suggesting that the first stage of revolution should be a national democratic revolution. First and foremost, before making Korea Soviet, it has to become independent, democratic Korea. So to say, so here too, Nation, I mean, nation wasn't necessarily rejected per se. It was understanding that nation is a reality, but it was a reality which existed only inside the confines of capitalist mode of production. The next stage of revolution had to be socialist. After independent democratic nation state would be established. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so let's bring in an idea here now that one of the Korean uh, philosophers, I suppose, or Marxist theorists throughout this is uh, uh, Shin Nam Chol. And he has, uh, for all his Marxist lean-in and the idea that you can define uh, Korea as a unique entity and then also part of a Marxist world, he does this through shared history and shared territory and shared economic life. He also has a unique fear, and you touched on this before, so I wonder how much this played in the Marxist uh, um, mind throughout this. And that was uh, a deep mistrust of the Minjok because he could see elsewhere in the world, this was post 1933, and he yes. could see fascist Germany and see fascist Japan and the horrors that that was doing. Well, we should remember one thing. Actually, colonial period intellectuals were perhaps even more globalized than Korean intellectuals today. <laughs> they were reading Japanese newspapers, but if you were a colonial intellectual, you could get access to the library of Imperial Keiji University, today so national. You had German newspapers, not only German, even Soviet newspapers, actually. And those people were polyglots. They were reading German, English, French, some were reading Russian. They were extremely well aware. And the newspapers they were producing, Tona Elbo and Choson Elbo, were extremely sensitive to the international trends. Of what was happening in Germany was on the front pages. What Italy was doing with Ethiopia was on the front pages. Uh, fascism in Europe was the most pressing task for the Korean intellectuals. They wanted to dissect and to understand how Europe is descending into a new sort of barbarity. So to say. So Koreans were oversensitive towards the ways how right wing authoritarian dictatorships were using and misusing Das Folk <laughs> elsewhere. And they were very afraid that a sort of nationalistic ideology is going also to be abused as a tool of power in colonized Korea. What happened in the end was the Japanese. Uh, constructed a new theory that Koreans and Japanese are ethnically the same. It was, it was called Naisen Ittai, the uh, 
homeland and Korea being the same. And then, as Koreans were now promoted to supposedly ethnical Japanese, they were conscripted into the Japanese army. <laughs> so, 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 <laughs> here's the idea of Koreans being one ethnic nation with Yamato was being used as a good legitimation for military conscription to an aggressive imperialist war. So, and colonial period Marxist intellectuals, of course, were very sensitive to this sort of developments, and that's why they tended to be extremely critical towards any ideological uses of Minjok, yes. And how long does this uh, alliance of sorts between the the communists here and the nationalists last? Because it appears to break down, through your writing here, it appears to break down around the period of the Great Depression. And I'm wondering why it collapses so heavily at that period. Oh, uh, well, you see, there, there were several things here. Comintern, the International Association of Communist Parties headquartered in Moscow, basically wanted in China and Korea nationalists and communists to fight together because Comintern considered it most effective given the Naskin state of communist movement in East Asia. However, in China, this strategy misfired. In the end, in 1927-1928, nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek started massacring the communists. <laughs> communists had to retreat. In the end, it was a long march. They retreated to Yan'an and they were saved when Japan attacked China and communists also emerged very prominently out of the anti-Japanese fight. So to say, so in Korea, Comintern in the end led communists to forge a sort of alliance with nationalists called Xinganghui. It's a it was a united national party, so to say, but. Uh, it, the alliance existed until 1931, but then uh, it was a time of the Great Depression. The disputes in the factories were multiplying, the peasant disputes were multiplying, the country was in the movement. At Singanghwe, where it was led by the nationalists, was extremely passive. So communists started to see whether there is any virtue in collaborating with the people who cannot lead the upsurge from below. And then at some point, the years 1931-1932, not only in Korea, but also worldwide, that were the worst years after the Great Depression. It looked as if capitalism wouldn't survive. <laughs> so, so Korean communists had the feeling that the world is going once again to be turned just all the, in, in a way, upside down. And in case of any great upheaval, communists had to be independent. They had to lead the proletarians unobstructed by any alliances. So communists moved away from the nationalists, but then came the year 1933. In Germany, the country where, as Korean communists hoped, revolution would come first. There were enormous hopes for German revolution at the time. What happened in Germany in 1933 was not revolution. It was counter-revolution. Hitler came. So to say, <laughs> then, mm some sort of critical reflection started in Moscow, but also in Korean underground. The uh, Hitler regime didn't collapse. It was getting stronger. Italian fascist regime was getting stronger and more aggressive. Fascism was spreading around Europe. And by the year 1935-1936, both Comintern in Moscow and Korea's own communists understood that revolution ended in counter-revolution, <laughs> so, so to say, it wasn't proletariat, it was counter-revolutionary bourgeoisie that, in a way, appropriated the momentum after the collapse of uh, 20s capitalist world in the Great Depression. So communists had to fight an uphill battle against much stronger enemy, and they needed alliance with democracy or with nationalists. And then everything changed by the year 1936, both in Moscow and in Korea, communists again were in favor of alliance with democratic or nationalist forces. So it was very dynamic. It was very dynamic, but we should remember that the world at that time was in really in upheaval. <laughs> in Europe, it looked as if old Europe was more or less gone. <laughs> 
And there is a, a moment in all this, which is quite interesting. It touches on that Marxist thing. It's a little bit of a sidetrack, but it is just on that same moment. This Marxist appropriating certain nationalist sentiment. And it's it, through some of the things you were saying there, it has uh, the idea that uh, Korean literature, despite being written in Chinese, is claimed as Korean. And uh, Korean history is claimed as part of a unique Korean nation because it's deeper history. It goes back further. And there's this moment where the, where the Marxist, also claim a uh, Chosun Confucian scholar and the movement itself. So they go on to interpret it, interpret um, the Shirha Confucians of the Chosun dynasty as precursors to modern uh, to modernity and critics of feudalism. And you write that this is a complete change of what it is, but this is a desire for Marxists to, uh, as you were talking about, no, not uh, nationalism there, to once again incorporate something that uh, perhaps isn't quite there to help further their own gains here? Uh, well, you should understand that Marxists are supposed to play many roles, indeed. So to say, they belong to a sort of universal trend of thought. Marxism is everywhere. It's universal. It's for humanity as a whole. But at the same time, they are supposed to operate in some of the confines of a certain national community. And as practical politicians, they are to lead, say, Korea through a two-stage revolution, where the first stage, as Comintern prescribed and Koreans agreed, would be national democratic revolution. Then Koreans are supposed to move further to socialism, but it, may, it could also take quite a long time. So, uh, Marxists were also the agents of democratic national state building, in a way, in, on the way towards socialist future. State building was to be democratic, but it also was to be national. So Marxists were also, interestingly enough, in a position of nation builders. Of course, if they were to build national consciousness, they had to build it in the way which would be in a sync with the Marxist universalist ideas of how humanity and civilization develop. The idea was that civilization inadvertently is developing towards greater freedom, because Hegel said so, the humanity develops towards freedom, and in Marxist version of Hegelia, Hegelian determinism, it meant that humanity goes from non-economical coercion, feudalism, to economical coercion, capitalism, and then to a completely free society, socialism or communism, so to say. So Marxist universalism presumed that the shift from feudalism to capitalism should happen at every society. So if you were to build your national consciousness in agreement with the universalist Marxist truths, you had to find where your particular national history was shifting towards capitalism. So that's why, for example, if you lived in former East Germany, you may know it. In East Germany, there was a huge cult of Thomas Münzer. Thomas Münzer was the leader of the Great Peasant Revolution of early 16th century and a Protestant, early Protestant preacher. Well, that's understandable. He led uh, German Peasant Revolution. But yet another great cult in Eastern Germany was the cult of Martin Luther. Martin Luther was no peasant revolutionary. Martin Luther was the founder of Protestantism. But Protestantism is related to development of capitalism. <laughs> so, <to> say, <laughs> so Martin Luther was progressive compared to the reactionary Roman papacy. And since this progressive happened to be German, and he also happened to live where afterwards Eastern Germany happened to exist. <laughs> so Martin Luther was celebrated in Eastern Germany. <laughs> Interesting, <laughs> isn't it? So this yes. is a, it was happening something like this. So Martin Luther was, well, Martin Luther, if you read Luther in original, you find out many unsavory things there. You find out that the guy was in favor of slavery. Uh, he said that slaves are slaves because God wants it. It's a predestined. And the guy also was a great anti-Semite. 
But anyway, <laughs> Eastern Germany, he was made sounding much more progressive than he was. <laughs> so, so, this is, so something like this was happening with Korean Marxists, who were in a way prettifying uh, more or less iconoclastic Confucian thinkers, forcing them to sound much more progressive than they in reality sounded. Because they needed to find some shift to capitalism in Korean history. Otherwise, Korean history wouldn't be truly universal. That was it. <laughs> so before we step into the modern moment here, there's this wonderful, uh, very prescient moment in, uh, in, this, in this period of Korean thought. And it comes from Park Chu. And he, he is this Marxist philosopher. And he begins to criticize this fusion of Marxism and nationalism. And he says things like, if you simply substitute the word class with nation, you begin to so you will begin to bring about a certain fascism of, of nationalism yeah. and you, you will uh, create an indefinite state of emergency, a place where blood and soil matters above all else and this becomes a certain trap and societies like this will slip automatically into dictatorship and this is quite a prescient moment when, he when you look at what's happened to both Koreas. Yes, exactly. The thing, it was a tragedy of Pak Chiu. Pak Chiu was an extremely brilliant guy. Uh, he studied at uh, KG Imperial University, today Seoul National University. He was a great reader of German, so to say, and he was perhaps one of those Koreans who analyzed in the best possible way what German fascism was and how it became possible. So, so to say, so after Korea was liberated, Pak Chiu was a universalist and he was a globalist in a way. <laughs> he was looking around and he was coming to understanding that most newly emerging nations were doing their nation building in authoritarian conservative way, led by authoritarian, often military elites, which were abusing ethno-national symbols for their political gain. He was thinking about Pilsudski's uh, Poland in 20s and 30s. He was thinking about the military rulers of Thailand and so on. And he was seriously afraid that Korea would just follow the same, this, uh, in the same line. Korea was underdeveloped nation where nation building was to proceed in a catch up fashion, most likely from above. What could stop Korean elite from following Pilsudski or Thai generals in abusing the ethno, ethno nationalist symbols? The problem with people like Pak Chiu was that they really belonged nowhere. Pak Chiu had to leave southern part of Korea in 1946 because extreme right wingers. Uh, had beaten him several times unconscious. Uh, he was subject to extreme right-wing terrorism, so to say. In North Korea, however, he belonged to less privileged, more, in a way, peripheral lineage, to the lineage of Pak Hon Yong, not Kim Il-sung, so to say. And this lineage related to South Korean Workers' Party, Nam No Dan, was practically eliminated from power in early 1950s. Pak Chiu was happy since he was given the job of training guerrilla fighters for infiltration to South. So what happened with him is that he died in gunfight against South Korean forces in 1949, being a unique unique philosopher of modern Korea who died while fighting with gun in his hands, so to say. But then what happened with him is that he was completely forgotten in North Korea, basically erased from history. In South Korea, the memory of him resuscitated. It came up again in 1990s. Before 1990s, it was unmentionable. He died with a gun in his hands of fighting against South Korean army. So to say, so the people like him belonged basically nowhere. They lost. They lost. They were too few. And both Koreas, in a way, came up in the 1950s, building up authoritarian modernization of regimes. And in North Korea, too, in the 1970s, 1980s, Minjok made a comeback under the auspices of Chuchia ideology. That's it. 
So let's launch forward into the present, or at least the very recent history. And this is a fascinating moment where Minjok comes back in this way, and it comes with the rise of the New Right movement. So this launches in about 2004, and it is, uh, in short, an idea where they're trying to, in a sense, change the way that the past is looked, because a lot of the capitalists that are rich and powerful in charge of these chaebol, the conglomerate in Korea, came from, or at least developed a lot of their wealth from this colonial period. And a lot of the officer corps that originally took over South Korean military were from the Japanese military. And there was, there was a movement on the right side of politics to change the focus on history away from the Minjok and onto a more of an economic or civilizing way of, of how you can view history. And this is quite fascinating because this is how Japan has retroactively viewed its colonization of Korea. And many countries, of course, around the world do this to justify colonization themselves. So take us into this, this uh, at least the ideology and the rise of this new right movement. Well, a problem for South Korean elite was that for a very long time, it had to preach something that it didn't believe in. Basically, who are what, what is South Korean elite? It's very much the old colonial elite, which was somehow reconfigured by Americans, <laughs> in a way. The most notorious collaborators somehow were put to the sidelines, also they never disappeared fully. Chia Nam Son, for example, one of the most notorious pro-colonial nationalists, remained the teacher of Korean history in the military academy <laughs> until he died <laughs> in the late 1950s. So those people were sidelined, but they never disappeared. But otherwise, all Japanese officers of Korean extraction uh, came back and started to head South Korean army. And the people who were already a bit rich under the colonial period, like Lee Byung Chol, the founder of Samsung, they started to get even richer than <laughs> this in Manri. <laughs> Even Chol was one of Korea's richest people already in late 1950s. So to say, so very much the colonial society in southern part of Korea just continued its development <laughs> in, in, in a way. It, there was no real decolonization. The problem for the, all those people is that they needed a mimicry, some sort of mimicry to stay in power. Since majority of the people expected after all decolonization, Japanese are gone. <laughs> those <laughs> people needed some sort of nationalistic credentials. And to get those credentials, they needed at least to represent South Korea as truly nationalist. So, if you read South Korean textbooks of 60s, 70s, or 80s, what you find there, you don't find there any praise for Park Jun hee joining Japanese army, <laughs> although <laughs> he did it. You don't find any praise for Lee Byung Chol supplying Japanese army with foodstuffs, also he did it. Everybody knew it. But anyway, you don't find it in the textbook. In the textbook, you find the praise of right-wing nationalists like Kim Gu and people like, say, Yun Bon Gil, who were throwing bombs into the Japanese military officers. Majority of anti-colonial fighters in 20s and 30s in reality were either anarchists or communists. They were unmentionable, and they were, in a way, erased from the textbook. So the handful of really active right-wing nationalists were put onto the monumental pedestal. They, they were supposed to be worshipped. So to say, but most of those people really didn't belong to their, their descendants didn't belong to the core of new South Korean elite. It was much easier for North Korean elite because they were the real guerrillas. They really fought against the Japanese. So North Korean textbooks were expect, expectedly enough praising the anti-colonial achievements of the people who ruled North Korea. That was pretty straightforward. <laughs> In South Korean case, South Korean state needed a sort of ideological mimicry, as I said. Things, however, changed in the 1990s and the beginning of the new millennium. Many things changed. For one thing, instead of developmental dictatorship, we have a neoliberal state in South Korea. You no longer have this mercantilist protectionist instruments. Uh, so, so to say, you have foreign capital controlling much of the banking sector, for example. You have foreign banks actually operating into the country. You have Koreans driving foreign cars. I was in Korea for the first time in 1991. 
I saw no foreign-made cars at all. It didn't exist. <laughs> so to say, now it's now it's neoliberal society. You you can get it. You ha- you even have Japanese cars in Korea, unbelievable. So so to say, so then you have now foreign-born population. You go to some villages. Half of the people uh, are, are, are the people coming from Philippines or Vietnam, and so on. So the, you have Korean capital going abroad. Korea becoming the largest investor in Cambodia, Vietnam, and so on. So, so for Korea, for South Korean elite, now it was a question, do we still have to cling to this old sort of ideological mimicry? And then, since after the 1990s, it became possible to say something resembling truth about Korea's real history, a South Korean elite was being increasingly attacked as descendants of the colonial comprador capitalists, which was true. And they wanted to fight back. And the best way to fight back was to say, yes, we are the descendants of Comprador capitalists. We are the descendants of collaborators. What is wrong with that? <laughs> so, to say, so conflation of those different things, increasingly multi-ethnic population, increasingly globalized capitalism, no longer protectionist, mercantilist state makeup, and the desire of South Korean elite to fight back the accusations by saying, yeah, we are descendants of the collaborators. And then what? (laughs) All (laughs) this conflated into this new right movement. Yes, the new rights basically are, I would call them, you have Muslim fundamentalists, Christian fundamentalists, Jewish fundamentalists. You know, a new right in Korea are capitalist fundamentalists. (laughs) 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 They just say it very very openly. Capitalism. So how, how, how successful were, were these uh, 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 right-wing economic fundamentalists? Because it seems like what they're trying to do there would be a, a tremendous uphill battle for all the claims to try and reform history and reform where uh, their certain people's money and wealth and privilege came from. It, it seems to try and rehabilitate this would also be to rehabilitate the the memory of the Japanese colonial period as a whole, and that would be a very hard thing to do. So how did this work out on the ground inside Korea? You know what is interesting? The first battle was a complete, complete failure. The first period of the New Right movement from approximately 2004 up to 2016, 17, it was basically a failure. In the beginning, there was an attempt to present themselves as postmodern, post-nationalist, uh, and so on. But the majority of post-nationalist, real post-nationalist historians, people like Yun Hedon, for example, distanced themselves from New Right very quickly because post-nationalists are also skeptical vis-a-vis state. But in case of New Right, they are not skeptical about the Japanese colonial state. <laughs> <laughs> so for real post-nationalists, that's already sus- uh, a bit suspicious. So to say, then you had the advocates of multi-ethnic society and so on, but they also started to distance themselves from New Right very quickly because the people who advocate multi-ethnic society are usually progressive, libertarian, or left. Again, if you praise authoritarian colonial state, it doesn't sound very well to them. So (laughs) in the end, and for the majority of public, it was a shock that people can praise colonialists, the people, I mean, given all the memories which are so much kept alive in South Korean society about comfort women, sex, sex slavery, and things like this. So in the end, New Right increasingly had to rely upon right-wing regimes in power. And since those right-wing regimes in power were getting increasingly unpopular, then New Right was getting unpopular too. <laughs> the last mm-hmm. new, uh, right-wing president, Park geun tried to, in a way, um, well, bulldozer the uni- uni- unified national textbook of history, written basically according to New Right ideas. But it was done in such an authoritarian, anti-democratic manner that just majority of population turned their backs. So the first part of New Right movement was a complete failure. But what is interesting now is that we have a very funny recovery of the new rights. They didn't surrender. 
they continued their movement. They are very well financed. And that's an interesting point, by the way. I wonder who is financing them. <laughs> so, <laughs> so to say the new rights continued. And now they are in a position. Now their books and their YouTube channels have the flair of being, in a way, um, opponents of the established order. So the recent new right book, Anti-Japanese Tribalism, it's entitled, actually became a sudden bestseller. And that's very, that, that, that's something we have to look in details upon. There is nothing new in this book. All those arguments had been tried before. And many of those arguments wouldn't stand academic scrutiny. Purely academically, it wouldn't go. If you put those arguments into a peer-reviewed article, you most likely wouldn't go beyond peer review because, for example, of serious problems with the use of statistics. So the most likely you would be stopped at peer review stage with this. But the books like this are not peer reviewed. But despite all this, this book gained enormous popularity. I think it has something to do with this flaw of being in a position. And also with, you see, neoliberalism in South Korea today is a bit like air. Uh, younger people, the people who are in their early 20s, they have no memory of any other system beyond neoliberal. Uh, many of them think about themselves as global citizens and they think about, for example, taking the education and going elsewhere, maybe to Japan. Actually, getting employment in Japan was one career path which looked increasingly attractive to many younger Koreans because Japan has low use unemployment and it's actually a very attractive employment market compared to what you have in South Korea. But now the relationship with Japan are being, well, in serious troubles. The right wing is blaming South Korea's liberal presidency for that. And this book is making a point of saying that Japan wasn't as bad as liberals are saying about it. So for many younger people for whom Japan is just one good potential place of employment, <laughs> those <laughs> arguments started making some sense, I think. So as a point in this, I wonder how important it is in your view to crash this idea, this new right movement. And it seems to be very important still inside Korea today that we talk about the Minjok a lot throughout this podcast, and that is the idea that uh, reunification seems to run along, at least be driven a lot by this idea of the Minjok, as in we are one pure race and that we are divided. And this seems to be a, a rallying call for a broader nation. So I wonder how significant you still see the Minjok being inside Korea today uh, as a potential unifier of the two Koreas. I think that there is a generational point to all this, generational side to all this. If you are over 40 or over 35, then most likely you would still conceive unification as a sort of great ethno-national becoming one, in a way. For younger people, however, what is the point now is not unification per se. Many of them are afraid of unification. They justly, not without ground, think that in case of unification, especially the lower segments of South Korean labor market would be just over flooded by extremely cheap and in many ways competitive workforce <laughs> from the north and they would be out competed on the market. Uh, so to say, so for younger people, what is the real point is not unification per se, but rather peace, peaceful coexistence. And then if you're a younger Korean male, one of your major phobias would be going to South Korean army, being conscripted. <laughs> so to say, but in case Korea moves into a peaceful coexistence mode, it's possible that conscription period would get shorter. And if two Koreas would really get extremely well along, maybe South Korea can switch to a full voluntary military force like Japan or US. <laughs> so, so to say that's also <laughs> this point. So I see here a generational divide. For all the people, yes, Minjok is still the ideological grounding for any unification vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. For younger people, they don't want to 
I mean, majority of young Koreans just want peace. They don't want any troubles with the North, and they want some sort of coexistence regime, which would, in a way, enable them to spend less time in the military, <laughs> or not <laughs> to spend any time in the military at all possible. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Which I think, by the way, is a good commonsensical approach. Mm. And I would surmise that North Koreans want the same. The thing is that in North Korea, conscription period is 10 years. Yes. <laughs> so they probably want the same and even stronger. <laughs> well, that's a great lead into a final question here. So uh, we talked about the Minjok throughout this. And of course, in North Korea, it remains a lot stronger as a principle that animates the society than it seems to do inside South Korea. And many people that see South Korea, as you mentioned, you've lived in South Korea for many, many years, even even though you have now lived in Oslo. Um, you... Uh, you must have seen on the ground the presence of the Minjok, despite the fact that South Korea is on all visible uh, metrics, a hugely multicultural society that seems to care mostly about uh, wealth development and standards of living. So, And you write in your article here that it is, it's still the main instrument of strengthening co social, uh, socio-cultural cohesion. And so I might get you as a final question just to tell the audience here how you view the presence of Minjok Minjok still inside South Korea today, and uh, how you see it going future, uh, going into the future. Well, you see, in uh, I don't accept Michel Foucault as a major thinker. <laughs> in a way, I'm, I'm not a postmodernist. But in Michel Foucault's writings, there is one very good concept: governability. So to say, the modern societies are to be governable. Govern. They are to be, in a way, transparent for the governance, and they are to be easily governable by the administrative authority. In South Korea, governability is very high. And this sort of cohesion is important for governability. When you govern people, when you issue your orders and expect people to obey them, that those people share a set of national norms, so to say, is a huge asset. Mm -hmm. uh, well, so, which means that even despite today's increasingly multi-ethnic making of the country, despite the fact that South Korea already had its first non-ethnic Korean parliamentary deputy, Jasmine Lee, who now, by the way, joined the Progressive Social Democratic Justice Party, uh, so to say, despite all this, uh, well, I have been South Korean citizen for 18 years <laughs> from now. I lived in South Korea and uh, now I'm living in Oslo, but I visit South Korea, say, three, four, five times a year. And so, and so on. So I speak Korean, I write Korean after, every day. And despite all this, when I am being introduced to TV viewers or radio listeners, I'm usually being presented as outsider. So it's a view from the outsider, which is nothing bad because outsiders are supposed to be well balanced, <laughs> not, not particularly sort of motivated by partisan rivalries. So to say, so when they say that it's outside the view, they are making me a compliment, basically. <laughs> so, well, this guy is objective, so, so to say. So I don't, I don't fault them for that. But anyway, even if I show my Korean passport in a bank then they say that I'm the Bugin. <laughs> I'm a foreigner. Uh -huh. <laughs> so to say, and they, they usually ask me, how do you speak Korean? How is it possible? Well, I say, I'm Korean too. <laughs> but again, uh, usually they, they just gla uh, uh, gaze at me and say. So how do, you, how, how do you see that? This is a great little point to stick on. Um, uh, do you see that simply because uh, Korea is quite a homogenous society and there's not a lot of foreigners here? Do they think that they're just confused because they haven't seen many foreigners that are so well integrated and Korean? Or do you think it's coming from a sense of you can't possibly be Korean because you're not part of the Minjok? I don't know. I think that in the end, I think it, it's more like a confusion. It's more like a confusion because it's still far from being typical. The thing is that in reality, there are lots of foreigners in many places in South Korea. The problem is that South Korea has extremely restrictive immigration policy. Well, it's not alone in that. So majority of foreign workers, male workers here are on employment permit, which lasts for three now four years, and then they're supposed to return to their countries. Uh, 
So to say, South Korea has very restrictive immigration policy. Not as restrictive as Japan, but anyway, pretty restrictive. <laughs> so it has something to do with that. But otherwise, I think it's just the paucity of the Korean people of non-Korean regions that makes people to stare at me. <laughs> Are you Korean? No, no, it's impossible. Uh, I guess that when the number of such untypical Koreans would reach some point, I think society just get accustomed to it. Why not? After all, in Norway, even in 1980s, uh, uh, 1990s in Norway, it was pretty common to refuse to rent one's house to, say, Pakistani immigrants. It's illegal now. But there were lots of people who were doing it. In 1990, up to 1990s, I mean, there was still a feeling that immigrants are sort of social exception. But today, in Oslo, one sort of population are immigrants, and 18% of Oslo population are non-Western immigrants, which means that they're visible. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not so, I mean, it's not so obvious that I'm an immigrant here. (laughs) Uh, So so to say, and my feeling is that the majority of Oslo people just perfectly accustomed to it. Well, why not? It, after all, it works. It works, and in case the immigration would stop, Oslo wouldn't function. I mean, immigrants do the most essential jobs here. They uh, they drive the subway. <laughs> they drive the trams. <laughs> they well, they make the uh, they work in the food processing industry. They take away the garbage. Oh, without all those jobs, I mean, there would be no Oslo. <laughs> so, yes. I think in, in, in the end, in South Korea, it would be more or less the same. Well, that is a great note to leave this on. And, of course, I promised you an hour-long podcast, and we've been going for an hour and a half here, so I apologize for that. But uh, there's just so much details here. Now, I'm going to link below the podcast uh, the articles that I use for reference for this podcast. Now, I didn't get close to touching on any of the detail here. It was just uh, too fascinating and too dense. But I'm going to link it all below, and I encourage listeners to go and read it for themselves. You won't be disappointed. On that, uh, Vladimir Tikhanov, thanks for coming on the Korean Hour podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me. It was such a pleasure to talk about all those fascinating things. Thank you. Thank you.